bottle that uh, have this one file application in, in, in their websites and, and and it's a very nice way to introduce people to what the framework can do in a really quick way when the user can just come and, and type something uh, really small like this and have a running application that he can use to get his feet wet with the new framework. Pyramid also has the possibility, even though it's uh, generally used for larger projects, it also has a possibility to create this kind of one file application. And uh, here's one example. This comes from, from the Pyramid main documentation. And when we put this uh, uh, on the website and, and start to show it around on Reddit, for example, people would say, um, yeah, it's OK, but it could be way shorter. Uh, we have a, a one file application that's just seven lines, seven lines, and you have like 12. I mean, that's huge. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it was like some kind of contest to see which 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 had the smaller one, uh, like a in inverse peeing contest. Who can do the smaller the smallest thing? And uh, well, the the truth is that uh, yeah, if if we took out this line that people say why you need that configurator, just add the routes and and you're done. This is one step that people don't need and. Uh, you can take two lines right away if you get rid of this construct. Uh, uh, I'm not exaggerating. That's really more or less how the discussion went. And, and well, turns out there's really a reason for, for this. Take a look at the code. And uh, what, if, if you're used to small frameworks, what, what will jump at you is this import configurator and this config equals configurator. And uh, all the configuration, instead of just being done at, at the module level, like, for example, Flask, is done on the configurator object. So one reason that we have this construct is uh, predictable configuration. Uh, what that means is uh, we always want to know that we're in control of, of, of the code. And since Pyramid is really hoping to be used for large applications, there are times where you don't control everything and users will have code that runs in your code and frameworks that de depend on other libraries that also uh, run in within Pyramid. And you want to make sure that there are no conflicts. I mean, if, if your code is larger than four, six packages, 10, I don't know, if it's large, there comes a point where you don't really have control of everything that happens inside there. So uh, one lesson that Pyramid tries to to take into account in, in the configuration mechanism is uh, the application programmer, we don't control the module scape, scope. Sorry. What does that mean? If we have a global import somewhere in our code, for example, in Flask, you want to uh, define a route, you just import app and then uh, perform the route uh, configuration in that same global object. Uh, or in Django, you have the famous uh, settings thing that that uh, is used for configuring. It's a global thing as well. What happens when there are uh, other people that are going to be affecting that code and overriding it or writing into it? It becomes a problem, and you have to be in complete control of things because there comes a time when even running the code in different order, for example, if you have a, uh, a couple of route declarations and and some other people have another couple of route declarations in their code. And if, if you run it first, it works. But if he runs it first, it doesn't work. That kind of problem is not really usual with small applications. But it can happen really easily when you have la a large code base. So in that case, uh, pyramid configuration uh, wants to avoid this. Uh, another thing that it wants to avoid is what in pylons, uh, I don't know if you new pylons or were familiar with pylons. It was a pretty popular framework before it merged with BFG to create what is Pyramid today. Uh, they had this concept of stacked object proxies. Uh, that's, that basically means that you import something at module scope, but you really mean to use it inside a, a view, for example. In Flask, you can do from Flask import request, 
And the request is really not something that you want at global module. It's, it doesn't belong there. You use it inside the view because it's very convenient to get the request whenever you need it. Uh, well, that has it, its problems as well. When, when again, you need you you are going to have problems when when many people start writing code. Um, also, when you configure routes at at module level, you have this problem that you have to run the routes in the same order every time. And uh, that becomes a little hard when, when you want to override or when you want to change some of that. Uh, so uh, that's another problem that comes from having, uh, for example, the configuration decorators from to that some micro frameworks use. They are at, uh, they act, for example, in Flask, they, ask, uh, they act at, at module level. And if you have to configure the app object that you import from Flask, and you add a decorator that acts on that object to, to get the route. When you do that, you're also uh, running into this issue that uh, all this is done immediately when you start the program. And you can have potentially some conflicts. And if someone changes the order of the routes, uh, you can have a non-working application, or, or suddenly you can get some routes that, that don't work. And one other thing that Pyramid wants to do is to be explicitly WSGI. That means there's a standard. Why shouldn't we use it? Many frameworks have some specific uh, special run method that, that it uses to uh, make it easier for the users to bootstrap the application and probably get line count by, by, down by one. So that's really. Uh, from our point of view, that goes against an established standard that is WSGI, and, and we strive to make it easier to configure using uh, standards. So let's take another look at this uh, one file app. So uh, you have to actually import the response. It doesn't get created magically. In, in it doesn't use thread locals. Um, we use WSGI ref in this application. That means it's explicitly WSGI. You can see that all the principles that I outlined in the previous slide are really used in, in the application. There's no uh, any superfluous line here, after all. You have uh, an explicit response object. Again, no thread locals. We accept a request. And uh, in here, you can see there's no global application object because we have to create a configurator object. Uh, the registration is done explicitly with non, no, no decorators. And uh, it's explicitly whiskey, as you can see. So uh, it turns out that uh, every line in the single file application has a purpose. And it might not seem that useful with small applications, but it is really, really powerful when we get to higher levels of code uh, compatibility. Um, Pyramid also has this thing called derivative configuration, declarative, sorry, configuration. And uh, it also uses decorators. So you'll say, aha, you're using decorators as well. You're a bad, you're, you're a hypocrite. Or, or. The thing is, Pyramid decorators are what we call inert decorators. When you, uh, when you import the code, there's no effect. Uh, you have to run what we call a scan right here to actually make those decorators uh, active. That means that there's no uh, import time uh, secondary effects, side effects. And that's really important, again, when you want to play fair with all the different components that may make part, take part of, of your application. So even though we have uh, a nice uh, decorator syntax for configuring views, and we do recommend use it because it adds locality to your code instead of having one file with the decor decoration uh, with the view configuration and, and and the views in a totally different file you can have them in the same file so uh, it's good but we think that the fact that it's done uh, just on command and scan is powerful it just doesn't go after all your code you can uh, scan just a single module or you can uh, for example uh, ignore some some modules explicitly. The configurator has uh, some other good things.
For example, it can detect conflicts. Uh, for example, here, I'm adding a view, hello world, with a name, hello. And somewhere else in the code, I'm adding a view called a different one with the same name, hello. That's not going to work. I mean, that's not, what, that's not probably what I was thinking of. This, in effect, uh, is a conflict. The bo both things want to do the same. Well, the, the pyramid uh, configuration mechanism can detect that and tell you that there's an error, a uh, conflict, and then you know that you have something to fix. Uh, when you encounter this kind of conflicts, uh, in large code bases there, there might be frequent conflicts like this. Uh, of course, if, if you can just uh, look to the code, and in that case it was very easy to just eliminate the conflict. But there are times when you really want one package that needs to do something and another package that needs to do something else, and they both require the same configuration action. In that case, uh, if you uh, use pyramids uh, configure include mechanism, you don't even have to do anything. Uh, there's a conflict resolution, uh, automatic conflict resolution step when, when you do that. We're going to take a look at this uh, further along in, 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 the, in the talk. One other thing you can do is you can commit the configuration up to the point where you are, which is what this config commit seems uh, it does. And once you do that, um, you are free to uh, configure something else, and it will uh, override the other configuration. There will be no conflict, it's just an override. There's also one thing that we call an auto-committing configurator, which is uh, when you create the configurator, you include this auto-commit flag equals true, and it will do this commit step automatically. So uh, again, it will avoid conflicts. Uh, the include mechanism is not only good for for code inside your pro program. You can include external configuration from other packages. So uh, if you have some kind of framework, frameworky thing that you that you have developed, you could uh, include its configuration in, in your code, and everything that it does would be there. Or you could choose just which parts of that framework you want to include in your code. So if you want to extend the framework, you have a lot of control over what you can uh, override, what you, want, you, what you can uh, include inside the application. For example, let's say you have a management interface that's uh, intended to, to allow uh, non-programmers to, to play with the content in your site. What if you... Uh, you have a customer that says, your, your product is terrific, but I really don't want that uh, management interface. It's too dangerous. I don't want my people playing with, with the content, whatever. You just exclude that configuration, and uh, everything else works perfectly. You don't have to do anything else with the code. You don't have to comment out anything. You don't have to create a fork. You just uh, not include that configuration, and there you go. Uh, the configurator also has some advanced features. Um, for example, let's say, let's suppose we have uh, the need to add a method uh, to the configurator. If, if we have a, a package named uh, pyramid subhelpers, for example, uh, and we have in this package, again, this include me mechanism means it will be called every time pyramid is in the scan phase, the configuration phase of your application when you start up. And if it finds an include me, it will run it. That way you can control, if you have several packages, you can control which one runs the include first and you can uh, include specifically the parts that you need. And in this case, the, we add a, a directive to the configuration. This, this is a, a config uh, command that allows, allows you to add a new request subscriber. And then a user in another package can just define a subscriber, and when it, uh, he uses the configurator, uh, he can uh, add new request subscriber, which is the thing that we added here. And it will perform any uh, configuration steps that, that you may, may want. That means that if you have a framework thing that, that it, it does something specific for your uh, 
line of work or of your customer's line of work, you can create a specific uh, configuration directives for use with that. Uh, an application has uh, several levels of extensibility. Um, for example, you could just uh, override or extend uh, the application. Uh, and it would be nice if the developer doesn't have to modify the source, the source code for, do, for doing that. Uh, many people think that it's no problem to just do a fork and modify it there and run the fork. But what if you have uh, 20 or 50 deployments? Are you going to do 50 forks and maintain all of them? It's better if you can just create a, a package, a separate package that does what you want and it's completely independent uh, of, of the other code. Um, there's another level where you want uh, some, some uh, specific things in, in an application to be overridden, to be extended. Um, for example, you really, really like this package, but you don't, li you don't want to use a view like this. You want a different view. You can override it. Or you, want, uh, you just want to change the logo. Uh, that's another thing that, that is possible to do with, with Pyramid. There's another level where, uh, in these first two levels, the actual de developer uh, it ideally doesn't, doesn't need to even think about extending the application. He, he just develops it, and it, being based on Pyramid, it's automatically uh, extensible. There's another level when you really do need some extensibility points, um, and that re requires some thought, but it's still... Uh, Pretty simple to get in Pyramid, and, and I'll show you how. So, um, what we use, or what we recommend for, for getting to the second level, which is we, we want to be able to override views, routes, uh, resources like, like templates or CSS. Um, we uh, have this concept of an override package, which is a package that's independent of the application and allows you to override this kind of thing. So, for example, if you want to change a CSS file or if, if you want something done differently, uh, like, like I said before, you can override, or you want to add a feature. You, you really like this package, but you want one extra feature, one extra view that, need, that you need for, for your uh, own business, uh, you can also do that for, from a package. Pyramid uh, only requires you to follow one rule, one simple rule to be able to do that. Instead of using the configurator to add directly views or resources and that, uh, you create a separate function that does that. Like you see, this is exactly the same code that is here, but it's in a separate function, and it's included in the, in the config step. step. Uh, that means Whenever you run your code somewhere else, you can just not include it and, and it won't be used, or you can override it with a different configuration instead. That's really all you have to do, and your auto application would be uh, uh, extendable. You can override routes, which is a little tricky because uh, you really re require... Uh, the routes are defined in, in Pyramid in the order that they are uh, added in the configurator. So if you want to override one, you might probably need to copy all of them into your package and, and, and override them there. So it's not that straightforward, but it's possible and, and it's easy. Overriding a view uh, is also possible. Uh, if you have this in your application, you are adding that view. Uh, re remember, we're using a function, uh, a method, in, instead of, of doing it directly. Um, we can include our own uh, our own view. We include this configuration and then we add a new view. And we use the same, uh, the same name. In effect, that will override that view without touching uh, the, the other package at all. You can also override assets. Which, uh, assets in Pyramid are CSS files or, or page templates or JavaScript, whatever. Um, 
And you can do it with a single asset, just passing the override pad completely. You can override a full package. Whenever any call to some package uh, that you want to override goes for a resource, you can tell it to ignore that one and use your own. So that's, that makes it really, really simple to override a, a package that has a number of, of CSS files, styles, and whatever, and use whatever you want, uh, again, without touching the original application. And you can even override just one subdirectory. Uh, let's say you are happy with what you have, but there's one subdirectory that you really need to change. You can do that as well. Um, even if you have an existing application that doesn't use the include me, the sorry, the the technique of, of putting configuration inside of uh, a function, you can still override if you scan it and then commit, and then you do your override thing. So uh, even if people didn't really follow the extensibility rule for Pyramid, you can do something about it and still be independent of the original package. The third level of extensibility, that which uh, has the developer add uh, his own plug points to, the, to some code, uh, is already there as well. It uses the SOAP component architecture, which has somewhat uh, bad reputation, but it's really not its fault. It's SOAP, SOAP's fault. When everything's named SOAP, uh, people get confused about which parts are good and which parts are bad. Uh, the subcomponent architecture is something that Pyramid uses, but doesn't require uh, a developer that, that uses Pyramid to use. You don't have to know anything about the subcomponent architecture to use Pyramid or to create large or small applications with Pyramid. But if you know the subcomponent architecture, you have a time proven, featureful uh, solution for extending an application. It allows you to create composable and pluggable applications. It's testable and it's fast. So if, if you uh, get over the fear of the C in, in SOAP, uh, you might be able to get some, some advantage of that. Pyramid uses uh, that internally for making these configuration tasks simple. And well, it allows things, features in Pyramid, like the different hooks that you can have. In Pyramid, you can easily change the not found view, the forbidden view that gets called on, on an exception. You can change the request factory, the code that, that creates the request. You can change uh, the before render event, which is uh, something that happens right before the template is rendered, and you can insert things into the name, template namespace, for example. You can, call, uh, you can change response callbacks. That means you want something to happen all the time, every single request, and you want to make sure that it's called, you can add a response callback, and it will be called no matter what happened with your request. Even if there, even if there was an exception, it will be called. Uh, no, sorry, that's the finished callback. Uh, the response callback is for, for the response to the request. Um, you can, of course, add a view or a route or a subscribe predicate in, in Pyramid for configuring the views just the way you need them. And you can register your own configuration decorators. So if you want to decorate something and, and make it work with the scan in Pyramid, you can do that. You can do lots of things. And all of this is based on, on the work that Pyramid does with the component architecture. Again, for doing these specific things, you don't have to, do, to use the component architecture. You don't have to know anything about it. But you have all this power available to you thanks to it. So. Uh, that's important. And if you get to the point where you want to create a framework and it's important for you to create your own hooks for whatever you want to do, it's really simple and possible using the component architecture. There are other uh, framework-friendly pyramid features. Uh, you get extensible templating. Uh, and pyramid uses the concept of a render, and the render actually uh, just needs to take uh, a, a dictionary. And uh, if you create a renderer for your own templating system, uh, you can use any template system that you want. You can even use several template systems on, on, the same, on the same code, on the same project. For example, there are renderers for Jinja 2, for uh, 
Mako for Chameleon, which are uh, the templates that come from SOAP. And uh, I think there are a couple more. And it's really easy to create another render for whatever templating language you want to use, even uh, custom templating languages for a specific uh, application that, that you want to do. Um, the view predicates uh, is also something that allows, allows you to create framework-specific things. Uh, and also, we have uh, programmatic introspection. What that means is, let's say you created several plug points in your code. And for example, you want to add some tabs to, to a view. And some users can create code to add another tab for the view. How do you know how many tabs the users in different modules that are using the applications have added so that you can take uh, appropriate actions? Uh, well, uh, the programmatic introspection allows you to get that information at application runtime. Right when the program is running, you can know exactly what configuration was added uh, and what kind of configuration was it was. So you can uh, have complete control over, even if the users added their own tabs, their own configuration, you can have control over that and, and, and know that something was added and where. Um, I'd like to show you uh, a couple of examples, just just uh, a quick look. Um, I'm sorry, but I didn't. I didn't have my my computer couldn't connect here, and, and I have a a borrowed computer, so I, I don't have this handy. Groundhog is a uh, proof of concept uh, micro framework that's based on Flask. And it was done uh, by Chris McDonough, Pyramid's uh, main author, uh, just to show that it could be done, just to try it. And it's basically, you can think of it as Flask re implemented using this configuration concept that we just looked at. And uh, this is it. The only thing I want to show here is the, the power of the configuration. Uh, we have a configurator. And uh, we are adding our own session factory and our own authentication and authorization policies. And uh, as you can see, we do things as change the not found view. And uh, we add a subscriber for the request to be able to add uh, anything that we want to the request. And what this does is that, for example, uh, we want to add a subscriber to the request. And when, when we do that, every time the request is, is created, uh, this G object will be added, and, and it will be like, like the context dictionary that that is used in Flask. And uh, well, as you can see, there are different parts that we are adding here that override pyramids, uh, bless you, that overrides pyramid uh, default configuration and makes it act like if it were a different, completely different framework. Um, again, I just, just want you to take a quick look and, and not not really think about all of this. We add the run method that Flask use, and several constructs that are Flask-like. And uh, well, it's just that we have created a, a framework. Most of it is done, if you took a look, at, that's, that's it. That's the framework, just the configuration and adding a couple of, of things. And your code will behave, even if it's pyramid, it will behave in a manner very similar to Flask. Um, 
There's also a small demo to let you know how how it works. Yeah, basically, you create a Groundhog app, and and you add routes, just like like Flask. So you can see this is not the way Pyramid works. It's more similar to Flask. It was done with Pyramid in just one file, and and uh, I mean it's not seven lines long, but it's one file. On a more serious note, um, there's this uh, framework that goes on top of Pyramid that's called Substance D. And uh, I wouldn't like to say it, but you can think of it as soap on top of Pyramid. It's a, many of the concepts that, that uh, where the good things in SOAP uh, that got lost because of all the bad publicity and all the bad decisions surrounding the project, uh, Chris uh, took them and, and tried to, to give them form with, an, with a, taking advantage of all the configuration extensibility that Pyramid gives. So you have Pyramid, and Pyramid is the base. And on top of that, you got Substance D. And Substance D is uh, both uh, a series of uh, web framework specific things and uh, management interface similar to what SOAP had that allows you to take a look at the content inside there. Um, I encourage to, you to take a look at, at this. Uh, there's, um, I just want to show quickly. When you create uh, a project based on, on Substance D, the framework, all you have to do to create an application based on Substance D, of, of course, other than reading the documentation, uh, all you really have to do to use the power of sus Substance D in your application is this. Include Substance D, then you have it, and you can use the features inside of it. And like I said, if you don't want to use everything in Substance D, just exclude whatever you don't want, and, and, and you have a powerful base for creating your applications. Uh, what, what's the URL for the demo? Thanks. You can take a look at, at Substance D in the in that URL. And it's interesting to take a look at, at the management interface. So you have um, several objects in there, and uh, this table lists the contents of, of the database. Uh, Substance D uses the CODB, and you can uh, manage the CODB from here. And it allows you to uh, interact with the content in several ways and take a look at, at its configuration. For example, you can have uh, security declarations here and, and move and control uh, the order and add your own. Uh, okay. Um, that's it. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Yes? I have two questions about Substance D. One is, would you say that it's equivalent to Django? And two, you could use another database other than ZODB? Uh, number one, uh, you can say it's equivalent to Django in the sense that uh, it makes decisions for you. Uh, if you use Django, you use Django's ORM, you use the templates, 
and uh, and you have to do make do with what Django offers. In this case, Substance E uses CODB, and that's what it uses. So no, you you don't you don't have the possibility to use a relational database with it as, as it is now. Yeah, if you want a relational, you can use Cody. Uh, I cannot show it to you because I have to finish right now. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we have a pyramid uh, open space uh, right after this. So if anyone wants to join, you're welcome. Thank you.